Next on stage, I would like to invite Mr. S. Premachandra, adv advisor, Colombo West International Terminal. Good afternoon. Uh, I must thank uh, the speakers of the session one and also the panelists for baking the cake. Cake happens to be automation. They baked it. So I am here to put a couple of layers of uh, icing on it. Why is it a concern today? You have already heard. Two terminals are being built simultaneously and both are going to be automated. I'm going to take you one line by line, keeping the surprise with me. Yesterday, ports were the largest employers. When I joined the Port of Colombo in 1978, I remember we had 22,000 people. Kavan shares this view with me. 22,000 people. And today, thanks to containerization, this uh, was subject to natural decay rather than planned reduction. We are still at 14,000, including private sector terminals and also workers hired from uh, manpower suppliers. So we are actually, if you compare us with global standards, we have a long walk ahead of us to really bring our manning levels to an acceptable level. Port business at that time was captive. We had our import exports, ships had to come, like US has its own imports and exports, ships have to come. India has its own exports and imports, ships have to come. It's not the case where Colombo is concerned. We are a hub. A hub has to survive amidst competition. It's a cutthroat business. So we, the port, like Colombo, can no longer dictate terms to the lines of the clients. Role of the port misunderstood. The subject itself denotes that this subject, uh, the port's role has been misunderstood over the years, over decades. That's how we see still 14,000 men in a place, in a port, where containerization has taken over more than 80% of the throughput handled. You still have manning at the same level uh, that we had when brake bulk was the largest share of the total move. So we are far behind. So port has to be the catalyst for development, not only of the country concerned, but of the region. Support the exim trade, right? And make a very high frequency of connections available for the trade. Retain hub status, that's a challenge. Speakers of the session one very uh, vividly elaborated the plans um, underway to ensure that we try to retain the hub status, right? And also, in current context, earn foreign exchange. Transshipment is a flowing business. Whatever you take out of it is yours. Your input is very little, but we, your earnings are far greater. So, Again, if you consider ports as largest employees, employers employing thousands of people, you are missing the point. The role of the port, in my view, is to create opportunities, not to generate business for its own consumption, make profits and consume the profits and be happy. Instead, a hub port should create opportunities so that the cascading effect will create new businesses which will in involve, which will finally result in development not only the country but of the region. What should we do? We are in a cutthroat business to retain the existing shipping business and also attract new business into the hub port. Continue to be a charity. We are a charity. When you have 14,000 people in a port, Compare with the with all the West Coastal ports of USA, 41 ports having 35,000 people handling a major share of the trade 
of the US. 14,000 people in one port, is it right? Labor, as often we misunderstood, is not the final result. Number of employees in a port is not the final result that we need, but as we have learned in basic economics, it's a factor of production. It's only one factor of production. To attract more business volumes and retain hub status, what should you do? Continuously enhance. I think this was well elaborated, but elaborate, elaborating this, I think we need to understand the requirement of increasing physical capacity as well as process efficiency, process capacity and process efficiency, often forgotten. We create physical capacity berths, we equip them, and we make the connecting infrastructure, and we promptly pro forget that there are processors that are very inefficient, that are very outdated, that cannot cope with the current demand. So e efficiency can never be reached unless you adapt your new system to the new systems when you develop capacity. Continuously improve quality of service. If you have capacity with no quality, you will still not attract the customers. You will still not retain the hub status. All this is nice if you can give those services at an affordable cost, a competitive cost, especially being a ranch shipment hub, you cannot attract business, you cannot retain your status unless you are competitive. Right, now I am taking one of those factors that will lead to ultimate increase of capacity, enhancing process capacity and efficiency, digitalization. Targets, elimination of delays, errors, and omissions, improve accuracy, and speed of transaction. We started way back in 1980s. We, when you talk about automation, we suddenly think about something alien that has never happened. Suddenly, somebody is going to automate things. It is not the case. Automation started way back in 1980s when container terminals started using IT for inventory control. Then came planning systems. Then came automated data transfer by EDI instead of typing in, instead of data entry. EDI came into being. Then data capture automation, optical character recognition systems, scanners, radio frequency identification systems, GDPS, DPS, so and so on and so forth. Those in came in. Those are all automation. But nobody agitated. Nobody talked about reduction of employment or anything like that. How much of employment was created by introduction of these things? This food for thought. Automated gate processes, fast processing of in, in, incoming and outgoing boxes and cargo. How much time saved, how much earnings were made, how much of new employment are created. Automated communication process between terminal operating systems and equipment. Instead of papers, voice communication, men uh, talking to men and asking them to carry out operations, IT systems started talking to equipment and drivers and started pushing things faster. Automated job confirmation, position detection systems, optical character recognition, real-time location identification systems are already in place. They are not alien to us. If you look at Colombo, Colombo has all these things. So why are we talking about automation in, uh, in, you know, in an environment where we totally don't understand that there are two aspects of automation. There is Automation of processes and automation of operations. Automated equipment deployment and job allocation. Today, equipments are controlled by the terminal operating system, not no longer by people. This is already happening here. So we are halfway there. We have a 50% walk ahead. Enhancing physical capacity ahead of demand. This was much talked about. This is essential to keep uh, going as a hub port. We create capacity ahead of demand so that volumes will flow into the void that is created. Ship dimensions grow continuously. We have seen that in 2015 when Rohan had his first seminar over here, the 16,000 TU ship, CMA CGM ship was in uh, CICT. And now when we are talking about this subject today, we have a 24,000 TU ship calling CICT as a regular caller. We have moved ahead, right? So need this requires the port to equip 
deeper berths, 18 meter, 20 meter deep berths, with taller and faster cranes with longer outreaches. In 1970s, the crane's height was 27 meters. Today it is 55 and WCT will have cranes that are 57 meters higher, uh, high above the wharf, right? Then outreach of the crane that reaches over the ship. You can see the growth of the outreach from mere something like, I can't see the figure. It's something like uh, 30, 35 meters to start with, and now it is 72, and I think the CWIT is looking at 73 meter outreach. Now look at the monstrous cranes that came into being. I will use this later on in my presentation. Ships, large ships, but they want to keep to the same windows, try and finish the ship's operation within probably the same time. Probably not the same time, maybe with 50% margin over the previous uh, operation from 16,000 to 24,000, they may allow us another 25% of the time. How do we achieve this target? Ad adverse weather conditions, being a tropical country, I mean, even uh, if you take uh, Eastern European countries, when you have the winter, you have situations where you have heavy snow. It's impossible to work when you have no visibility. How do you achieve these high targets? If you do not, if you are not capable of carrying out operations at the same pace continuously, 24, 7, 365 days a year. So, this is the issue. Human capacity has issues. A crane 57 meters above the surface and 18 meters below the surface reach. You are talking about 70 meters below. A crane operator has to place a box. When the container operator has, uh, train operator has to place a box on a truck on the key, on the wharf, 55 meters below, just calculate in feet, right? Can average human being see that properly? Can he place it proper, uh, precisely on the truck? This causes a lot of delays. This is humanly impossible for an average human being, even at young age, to achieve it. Continuous work without breaks. This is the other challenge. Hub ports cannot stop. You have to work three, 24 hours, 365 days of the year without a break. This requires shift breaks. You know, uh, every four hours, operators to change facilities for them. Every break results in a delay, no matter how much we try to avoid, can we afford this? The worst thing is the safety. With high-speed operations, uh, working at higher, at, uh, higher uh, working at great heights, handling containers from great heights, trying to control their behavior 60, 70 meters below, in adverse weather conditions, safety becomes a huge issue. High efficiency levels, I have been talking about the berth. Now, let me take it to the backup facilities. Higher keyside productivity requires higher backup performances, obvious. High volume requires higher density. We were in the yard, we were stacking six, high, six wide, three high, when we started in 1980s. Now, we are talking about 14 wide into 7 high. About 100 boxes in one block instead of 18 boxes. Right? Just imagine how to cope with cracking of those boxes. High transaction speed results in continuous high speed transfer of containers between the ship and the yard. This is also becoming a challenge. Productivity often is not achieved due to inefficiency in this system. These, uh, these are cranes uh, used in Rotterdam port. They are 10 across and they can go up to 7 high. This is the increase of uh, density where these ports achieve 85% utilization. Can uh, terminal 
manually driven terminal achieve 85 percent utilization without compromising on productivity? Not possible. Faster turnaround of road trucks, equally important. ITT is a factor of life. 50 percent of terminal operators uh, issue uh, worry is actually how to cope with ITTs. If you do not handle them, if you give uh, uh, stepmotherly treatment to the road trucks and the ITT trucks versus ship operations, you are done. You are not going to continue. Need high speed yard equipment, handling speeds beyond human capability, location accuracy becomes a challenge. 300 meters per minute a new RM RMG can travel. Can a human being control this? Can a human being control collision between two equipment that is running at 300 meters per minute speed? Impossible. The speed is required to achieve productivity. To keep the speed going, somewhere down the line, you need to use technology. Working at same pace in bad weather. We talked about it. It is essential. Zero errors on omission. Huge issue in manually driven terminals uh, due to uh, human errors. One box miss missing in the yard can result in so much of delays. One box located in the wrong place can result in 25, 30 boxes in wrong locations. The impact of this is delay to the ship, delay to the importer, exporter, and delay to the ITT operator. Manning port equipment is becoming increasingly difficult. We know an environment here, uh, universities and high education institutions are spewing out uh, men and women with high qualifications. They do not want to wet their feet. They do not want to get into overall. They do not want to wear safety shoes or helmets. They want to have a cup of tea, have a nice uh, sitting place, wear a tie, come in a car, uh, work in a good day, no, and nothing wrong in it. How can you facilitate it? Can you continuously do this? Working at height is becoming a challenge. Engaging more women, we talk about it. How do you facilitate it? If you, if you can't get pregnant women to continue in employment, mothers cannot be employed continuously. If more than 60% of the port trade requires skilled people, how do we in achieve this target of 50% even in 25 years? Manning cost becomes a concern. 24 operation requires more men and salaries continuously go up in ports. You know, the highest paid people in this country are in the port. So it becomes an issue for the terminal operators. Human attitude, I don't want to elaborate it. You know what can attitude can cause uh, to any operation. Human errors, we talked about it. Working round the clock is a challenge and risks involved. The safety and speed, they do not go together, especially in a manned environment unless technological solutions are found to control. We are far behind the world in meeting demand of the trade, unless we automate. Overmanning has resulted in low performance. Evidence is present. Overmanning has caused ports to lose quality of service. There is this nice story when one girl stitches uh, two trousers in a day. How many trousers can be stitched by two girls? Two. Because they'll start chatting. Sorry. Men also do the same thing. Mission of the port is not realized in this manner. All hub ports have embraced automation decades ago. Rotterdam, Antwerp, uh, Dubai, Singapore, Busan, Kaohsiung, you name it. You find a port, hub port, that is not uh, automated. Why is it not automated? Because they need efficiency. In competition, they have no choice. Highly populated countries have adapted not only hubs. China has gone into automation. Why? Think about it. So we fear digitalization due to the same reason. It's moving ahead now. It's time to move into automation of pro operations and equipment. We are there now. We are at crossroads, we automate now or we perish. Thank you.